let's get going. So thank you all for joining us and thank you especially to, to Justine for giving up your, your time to talk to us tonight. We're going to cover a number of different topics um, and there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask questions at the end. We've had a few that have been sent in beforehand, um, so we'll turn to those. Um, but first, we'll, we'll talk about some, some different themes. And I'm sure most of you uh, know who Justine Greening is, um, but not maybe not necessarily all the, the roles that she has held. So I'll briefly introduce her and then we'll, we'll jump in. So Justine Greening was a finance manager at Centrica before being elected as a member of parliament in 2005 and was appointed as vice chairman of the Conservative Party with responsibility for youth. Justine has held a number of senior government positions, including Secretary of State for Transport, Secretary of State for International Development, and Secretary of State for Education, and she is the co-founder of the Social Mobility Pledge. And I think we'll start with that. So could you give us a, a bit, of, bit of the pitch? What is the Social Mobility, Mobility Pledge? How did it start? What does it do? So the Social Mobility Pledge is about businesses and employers more broadly really making a commitment to think more strategically and act more strategically about their opportunities. It's something that I set up after I left the DFT, DFE, sorry, and um, it was really about saying that however good a job we do on closing gaps that open up on life chances in the education system, actually, you need to make sure that employers, and particularly businesses, are open to what is a really diverse Britain. And therefore we were asking companies to effectively commit to getting upstream and working in schools and talking about careers to then being prepared to open up their doors so the young people to come in and get work experience. So it wasn't just um, for people who had parents who could often get that organized for them uh, and do apprenticeships so you could inspire young people about careers and then genuinely allow them to have some experience of, of work and what that might look like. And then the third thing we wanted them to do was to look at their recruitment and make sure that perhaps through having more traditional recruitment practices that they weren't screening out some fantastic talent um, from different backgrounds just because it wasn't a process that perhaps they were as suited to navigate their way through successfully. Hundreds of companies are part of that. It's now the biggest social mobility campaign in the country. We also had lots of around 100 universities become part of it, uh, which wasn't something I had in mind when I launched it, but effectively it's become this incredible, brilliant ecosystem where you have these universities who are working upstream with communities, often more disadvantaged ones on opportunity and education. And then all of these businesses who are saying they want to get into that much wider talent pool. Um, and so being able to connect them all up together is a really powerful way, I think, of, of genuinely changing stuff on the ground. can talk a lot more about that because we found there's a huge amount of innovation already being done by businesses with their supply chains, what they were doing in communities, the work they were doing in schools, for example. Um, for professional services firms, what they were doing on recruitment and retention and also what they were doing, um, for example, with their clients and getting them to change their behaviours as well. So a huge amount of good practice already out there. And I think what came across to me a bubble from getting the social mobility pledge going and then growing it over the last three years is a lot of the answers on how we level up are out there. And it, the question is, can we find them and harvest that best practice and then scale it up in the places where it can make a big difference? Sure, no, that sounds great. Uh, I'm really interested in why you chose to specifically zoom into to social mobility. You've held a number of different portfolios in your career and I assume once you've left parliament, you could have gone in a number of different directions. So why is it social mobility as a, as a topic, the one that you really wanted to, to invest more, more time in? Well, it's something that's characterised my own life. I grew up in a very working class family, uh, if you can call it that, um, ordinary, very ordinary family in Rotherham in South Yorkshire. Um, I would still say that I feel it's a part of the country that needs to change and that people deserve more opportunities on their doorstep now than they've got. So in other words, not enough has changed in the last 30 years since I was growing up there. And I feel like I'm still the exception that proves the rule. 
um, the, the status quo rule is that where you start does overly shape where you end up. Um, and I wanted to do as much as I could to make that journey smoother for that next generation of people growing up um, from the kinds of starts that I had. And I also think, so I think it's good for individuals. I think it's really important for society because I think a level playing field is and that access to opportunity, equality of opportunity is almost this glue that holds us together. I think people need to feel like they have an equal chance at reaching their potential in our society. I don't think it's healthy when people feel like somehow they don't have the same chances as other people. Um, I think it's an economic imperative because in a 21st century that is all about knowledge and creativity, um, actually, having so many people unable to reach their potential isn't just bad for them it, it's like an economic structural drag uh, and I think it's important for our politics um, I feel that behind this concept of democracy and one person one vote is an implicit sense of that being the best way to run a country because actually then you get all of people, the people's voices equally represented in the parliament, but actually it was done with a purpose, which was then that people would have more chances and equal chances in their life. And if you go into St. Mary's Church in Putney, there's an amazing quote above the board, above the entrance going in, um, that is from a, a man called Colonel Thomas Rainsborough during the English Civil War. And he's argued for then one man, one vote, but he said the reason for that was because uh, the poorest he hath a life to lead as the greatest he. In other words, for him, this argument about extending the franchise to all men, whether they were rich or poor, was about the fact that they all had the chance to lead the same life, that they had the same opportunities. So I think it's societal importance, there's an economic importance, and there's a political importance because it's about really making our democracy work for our people. Sure. You, you mentioned there a little bit about the, the lack of progress that's been made. Uh, and I'm going to ask a bit of a provocative question, which is that if social mobility is the is the goal, something that you, you want to improve, a lot of people would say being a Conservative MP, especially between 2010 and 2015, but probably either side of that too, is, is not necessarily the best way of doing that. Um, at the end of last month, the Institute for Fiscal Studies said that real terms disposable house household income is expected to grow by 0.8 percent over the next five years which then means that by 25 2025 26 average incomes are expected to be 28 percent below where they would have been pre-2008 trend had that continued which is nine thousand pounds worse off per mm -hmm. capita in 2025 compared to what was projected which mm. to me is is incredible um, so it's a big question but how do you reconcile being passionate about social mobility and decreasing inequality and being a conservative MP, especially under the sort of Cameron years, but either side of that too. Well, actually, um, I'm talking about two things, not just creating opportunity, and that is about unemployment. And of course, we haven't had significant unemployment in our country. Uh, certainly in 2010, we were facing a credit crunch and you could look across at other economies like Greece and Italy to see the kinds of difficulties they were in and they remained in so there are different paths that our country could have taken at that point I think we took the right path which was to make sure we didn't end up with stratospheric bond yield rates because the markets didn't believe we had a an economic plan there's a wider question which is around the structural issues you've just talked about and and the fact is in a sense less that less that um we continue to be a not just that we continue to have um, a sort of lower pay, lower skill economy, it's the fact that actually successive governments of all colours have failed to shift the dial. So whether you go back to Gordon Brown and, and the labor, new Labour agenda of the single regeneration budgets and the, uh, the regional work that, that Labour was doing, that the... the, the um, devolved agenda that they brought in whether you go back to what David Cameron and George Osborne were passionate about which was the northern powerhouse um, rebalancing the economy to now um, seeing 
what uh, Boris Johnson is prioritizing. The reality is all parties have run this country and weak social mobility didn't just happen. It's endemic and it's representative of a Britain that has never had social mobility to the extent we want and has protracted and structural inequality of opportunity. So if we're gonna change that, then we almost need to move away from the more traditional old fashioned kind of debates around politics to recognizing that we have to do something very different and have a very different kind of politics in the future than we've had in the past. And that is much more about partnership and collaboration and recognizing that one size doesn't fit all fit also Whitehall doesn't have all the answers and it's about moving to being more comfortable with the fact that different parts of the country need different versions of leveling up and that is absolutely fine so we can in a sense you can have the debate around what's the right approach on leveling up but we need to recognize it's more complex than that because the right approach will vary in very different places so yeah it's almost shifting away Tom from that old um quite traditional argument um, with facts and the numbers as you've set out to recognizing that actually this is a problem that no party's been able to fix yet. And so we have got to up our game, which is why I think, as I said at the beginning, it is also about politics because it's about proving that our politics can finally deliver for people. Sure. So if this is a, a much bigger and structural problem that is, is going to outlast election cycle politics, how do you see us going about being able to start to unpick this problem? Is it through initiatives like your own and more of a civil society angle to this, which can slightly overcome some of the election cycle problems? Or is part of the system the, that we use to address the problems we face one of the reasons why we, we can't get a grip on, on this problem? I mean, I think when I look at the time I have spent in government and almost why I found it hard to maybe get this to the top of Parliament's agenda. And actually, one of the reasons I did the Social Mobility Pledge was to change that. And I think we, we have succeeded in putting levelling up right at the top of Parliament's agenda. But that was necessary to do in itself. I remember there being a debate on social mobility, probably about, it would have been about 2018, 2019. There was hardly any anyone in the chamber of the House of Commons. I was staggered that you could have something that I felt was so fundamental as an issue facing our country. It kind of sits alongside net zero. So you have planet and people, these two profound issues that we have to tackle. I was staggered that the chamber wasn't full of MPs wanting to, to make a, a speech on it. And so I did the social mobility pledge in order to try and radically shift it up the agenda. I think in, relation to the Prime Minister now taking on board that levelling up argument, I think we have managed to get it right to the top of the agenda. Um, and I think we do have to recognise that, that almost the political cycle, as you identified, Tom, almost naturally means that that part of our system is going to be quite short term focused. But interestingly, through the Social Mobility Pledge, what became clear to me was that Actually, many of the businesses we have who are invested in their communities and there for the long term can take a, a longer term perspective. So can a lot of that civil society. The universities we're working with are often hundreds of years old, but kind of again see that really long term state they have in their regions. And so it's not just about government. Government matters. Um, but yes, actually, you're never going to fix social mobility purely through Whitehall. And so it was always going to need that broader national effort to, to rise to the challenge. Government's part of the solution, but believe me, Tom, if I could have waved a magic wand and suddenly made Britain socially mobile because I passed the law, um, we'd have done that. I mean, you, you know, Gordon Brown spent an awful lot of money and that didn't, that didn't work. So it's clearly more than that and more than Parliament. Um, but I'm pleased now that Parliament's reprioritising this. Great. Now let's turn a little bit to levelling up. Um, one of the questions that came in was this, um, which was, isn't there a disturbing lack of clarity on what levelling up actually means 
would you think it would benefit from a more specific goals oriented approach like the sustainable development goals? Um, so what does leveling up mean to you? And you're a, the Secretary of State for International Development for a number of years. What do you think about uh, an SDGs style approach? So um, what leveling up means to me is it's the means by which to achieve equality of opportunity. And I was the person in government who came up with that phrase, leveling up. It's something that we first used whilst I was at DFID, actually, interestingly. Um, and it's then the phrase and the mantra that I took into the DFE, alongside a phrase that I also snappily felt summed up the components of a leveling up strategy, which was articulating in my social mobility action plan of 2017 that the challenge for Britain is talent spreading, <laughs> but opportunity is not. Uh, maybe I missed my career in marketing and strap lines. I don't know. Um, but essentially that that articulation of talents, but even the opportunity not was basically me saying there were these two halves of it. One was around education and developing talent consistently wherever it is. But the second was then this challenge of, as I said, with the pledge, connecting it up to opportunity so that it could really flourish. Um, I guess I totally agree with you about a goals oriented approach. Um, one of the things that I really saw during my time as development secretary was that that SDG um, sustainable development goal power. And I became Secretary of State for International Development in 2012. It was just at the time the UN system and countries that were really credible on aid like the UK. It was just at the time that we were all beginning to think about what the successors were to the Millennium Development Goals, which had been hugely galvanizing. And incidentally, if you talk to people involved in developing the Millennium Development Goals, they will, they will remind you that um, at the, the turn of the millennium, the big political argument and debate at the UN was around the Millennium Declaration. So all the politicians and leaders were obsessing over this text that was going to come out about what the global community wanted for the planet in the next millennium. And then, of course, down the corridor <laughs> was a team of people who, who were asked to bring it alive by maybe setting out some, you know, goals that might represent this grand declaration. And, of course, everyone forgets that there was a millennium declaration, although that that the obsession over those individual words was months and months and months. And of course, as soon as the goals were, the goals were basically almost an appendix to the declaration, but it was the goals that galvanized people. And so going through the SDG process and really being a big part of that um, as really obviously the person leading that British voice. And we were campaigning for a much more strong goal, for example, on gender which we eventually got, I'm delighted to say. Um, I again saw firsthand how you can take that complex problem of development, and this was around country development um, for developing countries, break it down into accessible galvanizing components that are goals, but do it in a way that means governments can run towards them, businesses can do that and civil society. And so that's that's where we came up with the leveling up goals was taking that same complex problem. And it is a development problem, I would argue, equality of opportunity, it's our development challenge um, and having that same kind of approach. And it's, it's, I think we have defined what leveling up means and what it needs. There's 14 leveling up goals and we've sense checked them before we obviously, whilst we were developing them, we talked to the Bank of England, we talked to regulators, we talked to civil society, we talked to businesses, we talked to the universities and broadly the 14 levelling up goals are now being used by companies, by universities, by national health trust and government departments to help them develop their levelling up strategies. So next thing that we will get finished off in the coming weeks are the measures that go alongside them and then we'll be able to start seeing are we moving forward or moving backwards and then we can start mapping all of the things that shift those metrics in the right direction whether you're a business or a government or a charity so I think it starts to unlock um, actually delivering leveling up on the ground.
Could you talk to us a little bit more about the, the 14 goals? I think levelling up, at least in the way the, the Prime Minister talks about it, could theoretically cover everything. Um, mm. So so what are the big areas where you think the, there's most bang for your buck in, in terms of investment mm. on issues related to levelling up? Well, the 14 levelling up goals, you can Google them. Um, and effectively, what they also show is that it's about a system fix. So I talked about the status quo. And if you're going to change the status quo, you can't just take a little bit of the system because otherwise it just doesn't have impact. So it's a bit like a leaky bucket. You've got to plug all of the holes, not just some of them. And I think one of the challenges we've had on policy is almost government might have attempted to plug one or two of the holes, but because the bucket was still leaking and it didn't feel like we were fixing it, they then said, oh, well, that's not worked. And so I think we've sometimes had a, a, a weak understanding, even when we've been maybe doing the right thing, because we haven't had a holistic approach that has actually made a difference. So the 14 levelling up goals cover education. They cover goals that are, at, are about getting the right advice and experiences. So you aren't just, you know, have the, don't, don't just have the knowledge and skills, but you've got that wider development you need they're about connecting up with opportunity and then being able to progress in careers obviously employers really are in the lead on a lot of that but then they're also there's a third tranche of them if I can put it like that that are around these other things that you know however good our education is however open employers are to talent if you're on the wrong side of the digital divide for example um, it's going to be hard to make the most of your potential um, if you have poor health and well-being again that is really going to hold you back um, in terms of entrepreneurship if you've never met anyone who set up a company and you have no idea how to do that you don't have the skills to do that you haven't got access to capital you might have you might have the next next apple iphone in your brain but you won't be able to do it and your company won't be able to create those thousands of jobs that come from those breakthrough innovations so the leveling up goals are around education they're around connecting up to opportunity and they're around removing those wider societal barriers that get in the way and what we're saying is that different parts of our society ecosystem lead on different bits of it so government has to take a lead on education it's very hard for anyone else to do that Businesses really have to lead on the opportunity piece of it. Uh, and then there's a wider, perhaps, civil society agenda that blows across all of the levelling up goals. Um, and of course, local authorities and, and communities have a crucial role to play because, you know, infrastructure for connections and opportunity really matters if you're growing up in a rural part of the country. Of course, if you're here in London, we've got tons of infrastructure. It's much, much more about the goals around companies being open to what is a really diverse city much, much more in the future than they perhaps have been in the past. So different parts of the country facing different priorities in terms of those differing levelling up goals that really need to be shifted for them. And that's where I think you can start to manage the complexity and, and break down what is a difficult challenge into something that we can actually start to say, we have a chance of shifting the dial on this. So Companies play an important role, education and civil society too. You did, didn't mention government there again, and, and it seems, uh, but because of the reasons we, we talked about earlier on, this is a, a big, complex, long-term problem that Whitehall maybe is not best suited to sort. Um, no, I think Whitehall has a crucial role. Don't okay. get me wrong. Um, on educa I guess what I'm saying is that's not enough. Um, but on education, for example, particularly post-COVID, it's crucial that you have a comprehensive, not just plan on catching up post COVID, but on, on, on how you close those education gaps that were there before COVID. COVID has made them wider, but you need a plan to not just get them back to where they were, but to eradicate them entirely. That absolutely is something that you need to see a, a comprehensive plan from government on. Sure. Oh, okay. So do you think, that there are intrinsic problems with the way in which government approaches problems of the that have these kind of characteristics 
um, similar to climate, I guess also things like digitalization, mm -hmm. long term, really complex, affects different places in, in different ways. Um, so I'm, I think what I'm trying to do is link this a little bit to, to the Dominic Cummings agenda and um, with your experience working in different departments, do you think there needs to be changes internally that enable government to better respond to challenges that have the, the sorts of characteristics of the challenges that you're working on at the moment? I think ironically often, um, and you know, it's ironic you mentioned Dominic Cummings, often, um, you know, people in politics want make make a case that there's a simplistic solution that will fix all of our challenges um, and actually the reality is life's more complicated than that and so the issue I think sometimes is that politics almost wants you to be able to say here's my totemic policy and it's going to shift the dial and actually the reality because because that's perhaps more straightforward to communicate to the public about what you're doing but the reality is the more that politics has been driven by, if you like, the need to dominate the media agenda, the more simplistic almost those messages have become. But actually, they shouldn't have been a substitute for having a proper plan. Um, and I think that's been the challenge for politics. It has become ever more short term because of social media and the news cycle. And that's then driven in the opposite direction to the kind of long-term collab it's become more divisive as we've seen over recent years and that's the opposite of the long-term more collaborative thoughtful evidence-driven policy approach that you actually need if you're really going to get change rather than what the electorate feel I think which is every time it's new government it's as if no one's ever looked at any of these issues before that this government is finally going to fix them and I think people have just steadily probably lost faith in a sense in that system um, and this time really do want to see do you want to see some change in terms of government reform I think the key area that you actually need to see government reform is in treasury so treasury um, I think too often doesn't have the right framework to effectively invest in human capital I think it has made some steps towards changing how it takes decisions on investment in physical capital, but I don't think it has a framework for investing in people. I think it sees that side of government spend as predominantly seen through a cost lens. And the problem with that is that when you marry it up against a short term time horizon, and let's face it, the comprehensive spending review is just three years. There's no chance to have that long term investment in people that if you're investing in early years may not pay back for 20 years. And if your numbers don't run out that far, then the danger is like, well, we'll just do stuff that pays back before the next election in terms of a return. Well, leveling up needs a much longer term perspective than that. And I think those are some of the pressures that often ministers face. But fundamentally, yeah, you, you need treasury reform, I think, if you're really going to unlock the ability to have that longer term investment profile in people that we need to make sure that lives start off on track and then stay on track and can succeed. And in succeeding, they will be far more beneficial, not just for people, but I think financially for our wider economy. So it's about shifting that shifting that short term cycle to something that's much more longer term yeah, is that not a a chancellor problem more than a, a treasury problem does it does it not come from the the political motivations of the person at the top which then affects how spending happens within the treasury or is it the case that there are more structural problems within the treasury which push the incentive towards short-termism independent of the the political incentives of the the person at the top i think it's a bit of both i think if you're the government department that gets to write the checks and in doing so you can start to have a conversation with another department about what they are else prepared to do to get that check um then i think you you wouldn't give up if you like that power easily the problem is if you look at any other big organization and i've certainly worked in some during my time as a finance person in industry um finance is run in a very different way and, and therefore, I think it's almost about Treasury catching up 
with a more modern approach on financial management that you know the rest of us who've worked in that area in other very very big organizations it, it needs to shift and modernize frankly um and it can do that i i think it doesn't feel the need to because there's no external pressure there's only one government if you're in if you're in a normal market then there'd be a much sharper smarter <laughs> a uh, forward-looking version of the Treasury, which would just out-compete this one. Um, but obviously there isn't that sort of competitive mechanism. So um, that's why you probably need a prime minister, frankly, to take it by the scruff of its neck and say, this is the reform I want. Okay. Well, we'll turn to education in a moment, but one last financial sort of orientated question before we get there. Leveling up is really expensive and we're operating under quite a lot of financial restraints at the moment given the pandemic and the other costs that will come further across the decade as we try to get to net zero by 2050 and, and so on and so forth how do we level up in these kind of financial situations i think you can't afford not to and i think you do need to do these more fundamental reforms to start having a financial strategy for britain that is a little more long term than three years um, you've got to bear in mind for the last several years, the UK hasn't even had a three year plan. So this is progress having a CSR, but it's no way to be able to deliver a long term plan like levelling up. If schools don't even know what the budget is next year, how can you possibly really for, for the schools that are finding it the toughest put in place some of those longer term? And by that, I mean, three to five year change plans. I've visited a school today um, in North Kensington that has over five years steadily improved and really shifted from being a requires improvement school to one that is doing much, much better. But that doesn't happen overnight, certainly doesn't happen in 12 months. So I think I'm afraid there's never a good time to almost start thinking longer term. And this is one of my observations from being in parliament is when times are going well, you end up with every government Gordon Brown was the same, saying, well, look, um, there are lots of jobs. Um, people are in work. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean opportunities fair at all, necessarily. When times are bad, then the point you made is the one that you hear, which is people go, oh, well, but there's all these nits and problems. We've got to get those fixed first. And, and so when you're looking at how come this is the status quo, these are the sorts of reasons why. The reality is that COVID has made all of the inequality of opportunity worse. It's likely to continue to make it worse. So I would argue there's never been a more important time to now break that cycle. And now's the perfect time as we decide what kind of country we want to rebuild after COVID to finally grasp that nettle. If not now, when? And we're having a massive debate about a skill shortage and the seeds for that were sown, of course, 10, 20 plus years ago. Um, and so tomorrow has arrived. And it, it's, I don't think it could be clearer that we now need to take some long term decisions for Britain on creating a country on equality of opportunity and the, the bills we have got post COVID are not going to be able to be paid as easily if we remain a country that uses properly probably about a third of our potential. So we get ourselves on track by delivering on equality of opportunity and by freeing up the undoubted talent that this country has to actually succeed and create wealth and prosperity and opportunities for as many people as possible. That's how we lift everybody's boats and it's how we get ourselves out of the challenges that COVID has produced. Could we not have taken that approach in, in 2010? It seems to be the, the opposite kind of approach, uh, approach, 2010 financial difficulties, the cuts come in, now we're in financial difficulties. Well, 2010 was about um, a credit crunch. So actually it was quite a unique um, downturn in that sense. Um, because literally there was no money. Uh, of course, we went into the Treasury to find a note that literally told us that and said there's no money left. So I guess 2010 was maybe um, one of those very different times. But I do think now um, it is about thinking 
longer term. But it's also about recognizing that it's not just about, it's not about throwing money at this problem. It's about how you get the whole system to work more collaboratively together and how you reform the education system to recognize that it isn't just about academic attainment. That's again, part of the, the issue, but it's not enough in order to close those gaps on, on outcomes and opportunities for people. It have to be a much broader education reform, I think, to make sure that young people are coming out, not just with the knowledge and skills they need, but with the right advice and with those experiences that develop them. Okay. Let's turn to education. Um, if anyone else has any other questions at, at any point, please send them in to, we'll, we'll turn to those shortly. So from 2016 to 2018, you were Secretary of State for Education. What was the best day in that job and what was the most difficult day? That's a great question. Um, I mean, often maybe the best day was literally uh, just getting the chance to do that job and walking through the doors as the Secretary of State was literally just one of the best moments, I guess, in my whole life. Um, I was the, shockingly, <laughs> this tells a story, doesn't it? I was the first Secretary of State for Education to have been to a comprehensive school. It's like mad when you think about it, you know, it's the 21st century for crying out loud. Um, so I was really proud to have been somebody who was a product of today's school system, able to then help improve it for, the next generation going through it just as I had. Um, I think just in maybe in terms of best other days, I mean, one would definitely be, you know, the day we got opportunity areas launched, um, which were this place-based approach on improving education that really was me saying, we need to do things differently in our department. Um, and they have gone on to create significantly better than um, the national average results for, for young people and children. I guess another great day was when we launched the Social Mobility Action Plan, which was that kind of comprehensive approach on education that I think we need and wasn't just about making gaps smaller. <laughs> it was about closing gaps, full stop. Uh, gaps like the word gap in the early years where we know that that has a huge, the, the, the difference in vocabulary between little kitty winks getting the best start and children getting a less advantaged start. We know that kind of absolutely explains so much of the rest of their education experience. So loads of great moments. I loved working with the teaching profession, loved working with the department, loved my trips out to schools. Uh, most difficult day obviously was the day that I had to leave because I would have loved to stay. But I made a choice to keep on working on social mobility, whatever it took. And so if I couldn't do that in the DfE, then I was going to do it on the back benches. And I set up the social mobility pledge within two months of leaving the DfE. And actually, I guess I'd never have done that if I'd stayed at the DfE. So ironically, you know, maybe um, maybe although I wanted to stay, actually, it's given me the chance to really work on this other half of social mobility. Sure. Blessing in disguise. Someone sent in a question about, about private schools, um, which I think connects to this. So the, the first part is, should private schools be abolished? Um, but the, the second part is, how do we level up state schools to be able to compete with private schools? Because if they mm. were to be abolished, it's probably not going to happen for a few years. So how do we level up state schools to, to be able to compete with, with private schools? Well, I'm not sure whether that's really, I necessarily even agree with the hypothesis behind that question. Um, I think the reality is that the, the hundreds of employers we're working with through the Social Mobility Pledge um, increasingly know and understand and can see that grades, academic grades that you get in exams are, of course, important, but they often are necessarily a reflect not just of how much effort a person's put in, but how much resource was invested in that person's education. So if you've gone to a private school and had three times as much resourcing put into uh, your education, then they're more interested in seeing beyond that um, to that potential of the person themselves. So most of our employers want to get to that wider talent pool and, and are seeing well beyond um, academic attainment. Um, 
And I think also recognizing that um, diversity matters. Um, there was some great work done by McKinsey a few years ago that looked at the financial returns of companies that were more diverse, particularly around their leadership teams versus financial returns of companies that were not. And there was a very clear um, correlation that more diverse companies generate better financial returns, end of. That's almost certainly because there's less chance for group think, there, there's, there are more ideas, and so you get more innovation and all of that. So, you know, in a, in a, in a funny way, um, and I guess, you know, so you think, why do people send their kids to private school? They think they're getting a better education, they're gonna get better grades, and um, they'll be better connected, I, I guess. Um, but none of those things really hold as much as they used to do. So employers are more interested in this wider person um, than someone who's maybe been very schooled with lots of resources to get an A star. Um, they want people who actually have got a natural understanding of that diversity is out there in the real world. And so the danger is, I think they feel that for private schools, maybe if you only had a narrow exposure to it, like you won't have really, if you don't understand difference, it's going to be hard to get the most out of it um, once you get into a workplace that is full of difference. Um, and I guess also even on connections, we've got LinkedIn these days. The old boys network doesn't really, well, it's not appropriate. It's not, I don't think it's particularly socially appropriate um to um give jobs based on who you know um to your chums and but also i just think it's been competed away by linkedin i can find great people just by going on on that now and they can find me so i just almost feel that i i get the logic for it you know in the past but the logic for it in the future you know we're moving towards a place where opportunities need to go to people who are best qualified, best talented to get them and with the best potential. And so employers are kind of just like finding new ways to do that and, and they want to get that diversity. So yeah, it's, um, I'd almost argue in a way, the big challenge for private schools is how are they going to, how do you make sure, I guess, that, you know, the young people that you have are getting, getting that broader, view of life because you know the danger is you, if you're not exposed to that diversity then you know maybe you won't know how to get the most out of it once you're part of that wider world so I think there's a need for you know a genuine debate across this country about what we want for all of our young people in education irrespective of whether they're if you like part of the state system which is 93 percent of people or if you like part of that that other private sector on education um, and nobody gets to choose their start so um, I, I think it's it is about that more holistic debate around you know wherever whichever bit of it you've been in you you almost certainly didn't make your own choices so how can we make sure that the pros and cons of both paths if you like don't hold people back so oh, on that question education has changed massively over the the past few months to allow us to continue learning in the pandemic although for a lot of people they weren't able to do that what do you think we should take from the past few months and how do you think we should use that to improve education as we go forward and, and return to some kind of normality i you see i think that's such an important question actually tom because what we've really seen during covid is the rise of online learning. Um, we've had to do all sorts of things, whether it was knowledge and, and normal classes, whether it was mentoring, whether it was development, whether it was events and experiences, all of it moved online. And actually, as challenging as the pandemic has been, it has forced all of us to really confront the fact that there are very different ways of working. And so there are threats that come with that, I think. Um, you know, for example, a lot of my learning as a young accountant at PricewaterhouseCoopers was watching 
for people and seeing what more experienced staff did and how they dealt with clients. That is obviously harder if you're working more remotely. On the other hand, it's a lot easier to access training online and probably easier for me to get mentoring if I'm a junior member of staff online and through Zoom than maybe getting that time in that diary with the boss when I was out at the client and they were back at the office or whatever. I think you think about the access of opportunities for people who were more disabled, for example, it's not as easy to go on public transport or they have caring responsibilities. It may well be that a hybrid approach on work for them is the way in which they can actually manage to have an opportunity that before they had to be in that office was just um, impossible. So you know, equally though, going to a, an interview and if it's online and if you're in a like half a mile from me on the Alton estate, living in an overcrowded flat, worried that your 15 year old brother's gonna come in the room anytime when you're in the middle of an interview, yeah, or you don't have a dig digital you know, um, device or you can't afford the data. So I think what we're confronting is just different. And one of the things often you've got to, I think, learn in life is if change is coming, you either get ahead of it and work out how to succeed in that different world, or you'll just be kind of shaped by it. It's shape will be shaped. It is going to be different, but it could be good different because of the different ways of working and some of those online routes of working could be some of the ways that we close some of those gaps for example um, in education so it's about getting a balance um, and recognizing that it's going to be a new world but um, yeah we've got a chance now to eradicate some of those risks but lock into some of those opportunities it presents as well sure let's let's turn to some audience questions if you'd like to ask one on the zoom feel free to um, stick a message in the chat or turn the camera on um, and you can you can ask it on the call we've had a couple coming through on the, the youtube that I'll, I'll start with one of them is um, about the department for education and it is saying that um, the department for education is is disliked by the majority of the teaching professional it seems like that is the case most of the time and Gavin Williamson has extended that to the overwhelming majority of the student population. <laughs> Would you agree with that? And if you do, why do you think this is and what can be done to, to reconnect the department with teacher, teachers and students? I think it's been a really tough time for um, everyone involved in education, actually. Um, I think the I, I think particularly for for schools. You know, it's often felt frustrating getting guidelines and decisions, you know, that were quite late in the day. I think equally um, within the DfE, nobody had ever had to deal with a pandemic before. So this was there was not this manual that you could get off the shelf that said how to continue education during a pandemic. I think the key thing is almost just, you know, there's no point in a sense talking about a better relationship you have to get on and develop one if you're the secretary of state and that means not saying i'm going to listen but then not doing it but just getting on with the legwork of being in schools and finding out about the issues and then genuinely working through those often competing perspectives to to taking you know sensible decisions that will bring a teaching profession with you so uh, I guess um, I guess the key is having a shared agenda, but I felt we genuinely found one, which was around the role that education plays in delivering equality of opportunity. Overwhelmingly, the teachers that I talked to, that's the thing that we all cared about. And I think it's about remembering that there's that common mission and a sense of urgency around it well as well and I think what certainly what I was trying to do was really galvanize the DfE around that mission um, so that there was almost that shared voc sense of vocation around what we were all trying to accomplish um, and I think then finally recognizing that yeah there'll be those debating points where there isn't agreement but that's that's life <laughs> um, and certainly the discussions I would have with the teaching unions, I was very frank with them that there'd be areas where we just didn't agree and, and but we shouldn't let that stop us 
from making progress on the many more areas where actually we were aligned and we could get on with things. And actually the debate's healthy. So we shouldn't worry too much about the fact that there are areas even where we disagree. Um, that is just how it is going to be. The key is almost, and the test for success is how you deal with those disagreements and whether you let them derail a whole broader agenda that everyone's on board with. And I, I never, I, I don't, I hope that I, I never let that happen. I, I think we were able to move ahead with quite a lot of stuff collectively. Um, I think that's what parents want to see as well as students. We've got one other question which has come in, um, which I think we, we picked up on um, throughout the, the conversation, um, but maybe to address it a little bit more specifically, what are the biggest factors driving social inequality today? Well, I think, um, great question. So, so the levelling up goals articulate, if you like, the problems, the challenges that we have to fix. So I'd probably say there's 14 of them in that sense, but it starts with education and gaps. Um, there's a big bit around um, how, to what extent opportunities are genuinely open. And I think from that needs to come almost societal change. I think our expectations need to be in a different place around being able to reach our, our potential. I think above all, it's about having real choices that people understand and know how they can how they can get to. So rather than it just being about aspiration, it's much more about I know the direction I need to get to or where rough the destination I'm trying to get to. And I know the immediate next steps that I can take and I have some choices around them and that those choices on pathways ahead are high quality. And that, again, is where government comes in, because it's about making sure those different education routes people want. Um, a good whichever ones they choose to have. Okay, uh, I've got one more question myself, but if anyone else would like to ask a question, please send it in. We've got one, let's go to that first. So the question is from Ellie and it says, what would you say Cambridge and other universities can do to help combat social inequalities and aid social mobility? How much of a role do they have? I think, I think your leaders, it's as simple as that, um, both nationally and internationally. And that's why the role that both Oxford and Cambridge play is so important, because you should be setting that example. I think there have been welcome steps by both universities in opening access up. But I still think there's a long way to go. And I think particularly when it comes almost, I'd argue, to the research agenda, I think that the lack of diversity in academia is a real problem. So if we know <laughs> that diversity equals better results, and we absolutely need to see our higher education sector of which Cambridge and Oxford are at the core, obviously, as these amazing research powerhouses, then this issue of diversity in academia becomes crucial, doesn't it? to safeguard our future. So actually, there's even more at stake, I think, for Oxford and the Russell Group in becoming more open to more young people because, it, because actually you need that diversity of thought in order to continue to play that leadership role in a way. Um, so yes, I, I guess one other thing I'd say is, um, but it's nothing to do with the question that Ellie just asked, but, but I'll float it anyway. So, so from my perspective, I think, and I said this at the DfE, but definitely need a reform on student finance. Um, and by that, I mean, I think the whole approach on tuition fees and loans needs to be reformed. I think you keep a graduate contribution, which is actually what you all end up paying as graduates. But I think you make that more progressive, not less has been potentially muted in the paper um, and I think you then almost have a, a separate debate and discussion with higher education institutions about value for money and you know how they're investing that cash um, but I think you could still do a time limit to graduate contribution and of course what that would mean is you wouldn't have this as it were fake loan system that you know, has a, a quote unquote loan that's earning quote unquote interest, <laughs> but what you pay back is nothing to do with, as it were, annually 
how much you're owing and the interest rates, nothing actually to do with interest rates is to do with inflation. That I don't think is fit for purpose. And I think if that level of debt starts to put off young people from lower income backgrounds from going, then I think that's a real problem that we should just leave into so my, my proposal even back then that we were developing for Theresa May was that you would get rid of all of that you keep the graduate contribution maybe probably keep it time limited but make that more progressive and then the other part of it that I wanted to see was in the same way that employers are paying uh, an apprenticeship levy because we know that vocational skills count I think you widen that concept becoming a skills levy and I think absolutely employers crucially benefit from the graduate workforce that all of your universities are are turning out that we need and so I would have had a more flexible approach where you would have had employers also paying into that higher education pot that your graduate contributions going into so that those next generations could also continue to go to well-funded universities and and I I think it's it's time we now recognize that you know, sending graduates that that statement with those massive numbers on that are growing out of, you know, out of control with interest rates going up and all of that, you know, in the coming months, you know, especially when they have no chance, you know, of ever paying it back. I think you're better off having a grown up debate about what's the graduate contribution graduates should pay in order to allow a system to be there for, you know, young people in the future who also want the chance to go to well-funded universities. Great. Yeah, I think we'd all be in favour of, of something like that. Well, I don't but, know. You tell me. That, that's why I'm floating it, because I, I gen, you know, I, I think we do need to have a, a proper debate about this. I, I think, you know, you as a generation, you actually have been and are prepared to contribute to your higher education. I think that's a really important step that you all take. But I think the system that you're paying into needs to be better structured. Um, And I think it's, you know, I'm from a working class background, but I ended up going into finance, getting a really great career. So someone doing better out of their degree should be paying more back into the system through that graduate contribution than, say, someone who comes out of it, goes into teaching, which is a crucial career, but literally has no chance really of paying off that that loan and just sees it there. So we all need to kind of recognize that this system as it stands doesn't work. I think it's really good that graduates make that contribution into it. And I think let's have a debate about what that is and how much it should be and making it fairer, not less fair. And let's have a debate about, you know, the contribution that businesses can make a lot of them already do anyway to bursaries and I think you should bring back the maintenance grant as well um I just think that was a mistake to remove it um so that's that's probably the third element to get fixed definitely in favor of a, a maintenance grant I think we, we'd all appreciate that too well, probably means tested let's be absolutely clear but I, I do I do think sure. it's perverse that young people from you know the lowest income families end up coming out with the highest debt I mean that 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 can't be right so it's those sorts of, I think it's about fairness, isn't it? Um, and I think it's about making sure that balance is in the right right place. And, you know, your generation is probably as best placed as any to, in a sense, have a debate around where you think that, that balance should be struck. But um, I think at the moment, we're not able to have that debate and it's time that that changed. Sure. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But thank you so much for for joining us this evening. It's been really interesting. And thank you for sharing all your insight that you've built up from so many different experiences. And thank you, everyone, for, for watching too. Have a great rest of the evening. Thanks for having me. Great thank questions, you. Tom. Well done. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>